Okay, uh, thank you everyone uh, to joining uh, today's seminar. Um, uh, before I formally or informally introduce um, today's speaker, uh, some logistics uh, for all of you. Uh, please mute yourself during the seminar unless you have a question. And if you do have a question, please um, use the chat room. And um, obviously no classified discussion today. And uh, that's about it. And um, otherwise just enjoy the talk. All right, uh, let me uh, introduce uh, today's speaker. Um, I'm super happy to have Dr. Tujar here with us virtually. I have known her quite a long time, so I can introduce her somewhat informally. Uh, Dr. Tujara and I went to the same school and the same program for PhD, that is ICME at Stanford University. Back then she was famous uh, or somewhat notorious for her diligence and academic achievements. She was getting all A plus on the courses that we were struggling to even pass and survive. No need to say that we were jealous a bit. She has continued her reputation until today without surprise. She is now a principal member of technical staff at Sandia National Laboratories, actually across the street from us. She has made many great achievements so far. You can check out them in uh, her bio, but just to give you one great achievement. In 2019, Dr. Tsuzer was awarded the Presidential Early Career Award for scientists and engineers for developing new impactful mathematical methods and computer algorithms to enable real-time analysis, control, and decision-making on computationally prohibitive problems relevant to the nuclear security mission and climate modeling. Without further ado, let's now hear a great talk on the Schwartz alternating method as a means for concurrent multi-scale coupling in solid mechanics. Here you go, um, Irina. So yeah, you're... Thank you, Yangsu, for the invitation and for the um, you know, way too flattering of an, an introduction, <laughs> I think. But um, it's really a pleasure to uh, have the opportunity to give a talk. Um, obviously, I'd prefer to do it in person, but um, you know, it's good to be able to do this virtually, even in these um, very strange times. Um, so, uh, as Young Su said, I'm going to be talking about the Schwartz alternating method as a means for concurrent multi-scale coupling in solid mechanics. This is something I've been working on for about six years now. Um, so, I'm in the quantitative modeling and analysis department um, at Sandia, California, across the street from, um, from you guys. Um, and this is with a couple of my collaborators in department also in San Diego, California, and um, Greg Flippo, who was a, a summer student we had um, a few years back, who's currently at MSC Software in New at Newport Beach. So let's, um, oh, let's see, oh, this is not, oh, here we go, okay. Um, so here's the, the outline for the talk. Um, so I'm, I'm going to start by um, giving a little bit of, of motivation and background for why we're interested in concurrent multi scale coupling methods and kind of why we've selected the Schwartz uh, framework as a means to achieve this, this coupling. Uh, the main part of the talk is going to have two parts. So uh, the first part is going to focus on um, uh, some of the earlier work we, we did in, in developing the method for the case of concurrent multi-scale coupling uh, for quasi-static problems in solid mechanics. And then the, the second half is going to be on um, some more recent work we've been doing in extending the method to dynamics. Um, so for each of these, I'll um, go through the formulation of the method. I'll talk a little bit about the theory. Um, I'll talk about implementation of the method in two codes, um, Albany LCM and CR Solid Mechanics. And then I'll show um, different numerical examples. So this, this talk is definitely heavy on the numerical examples. Um, you know, hopefully those will give you a sense of some of the properties of the method and the types of problems you can use um, the method to solve. Um, and it's not the whole hour, um, so uh, you know there should be some time for questions. I, I may kind of stop and ask her questions in between the sections, um, so we, we can kind of play that by ear. Um, okay. So uh, the first thing I wanted to um, to discuss is a little bit of motivation and background. So I'll I'll start with um, 
motivation for um, developing and using concurrent multi-skill coupling uh, methods. Um, so essentially, a lot of the, the problems that are of interest to um, Sandia National Labs, and, and I think this is certainly true for Lawrence as well, um, require us to simulate and understand the large-scale structural failure of uh, engineered components. Um, so this comes up a, a lot in some of our um, nuclear deterrence type uh, mission spaces where you know, the components may be comprising, for instance, weapons type systems. Um, for uh, these types of uh, problems, what often happens is a large-scale structural failure frequently originates from a small-scale phenomenon such as a defect or a microcrack which grows quickly in an unstable manner and can lead to the ultimate uh, large-scale structural failure of the entire uh, object or system. So there's a couple of examples of this um, on the right. Um, at the top, we have a roof failure of a Boeing 737 aircraft that occurred due to fatigue cracks. Uh, the bottom picture is more of a Sandia um, application. This is from GTS modeling or gas transfer systems modeling. Um, there's a surface flaw in a pressure vessel it interacts with the, the microstructure that's present there, and um, that interaction may or may not lead to, to failure of the ultimate of the vessel. And um, you know, it's really important to do this modeling very carefully to make sure you, um, you make the right prediction of whether or not the failure happens. Um, so because of the very tightly coupled interaction between the small and the large scales for these types of problems, um, what we found is that concurrent multi-scale methods are really essential when trying to understand and predict the behavior of these um, engineered uh, systems. And so when I say concurrent methods, um, I essentially mean uh, methods that provide two-way coupling where you have information propagating uh, back and forth concurrently between the, the multiple scales that are involved. Um, and so what we found is that um, if we don't use these concurrent or two-way coupled methods, we don't always get an entirely correct solution, so we may not be able to predict this failure for the uh, pressure vessel example um, correctly, for example. Um, so, uh, oh, how do I make this top part go away? Because you can probably, oh, okay. Ah, there it goes, okay. Uh, so uh, this, this present work is not our first um, foray into developing concurrent multi-scale coupling methods. Um, this is a paper that was published in 2014 by my um, co-author Alejandro Moda um, and his collaborator uh, Steve Wei Ching Sun, who used to be at Sandia and currently at uh, Columbia University. And so in this paper, um, Steve and Alejandro uh, develop a three-field multi-scale coupling formulation. It achieves this concurrent coupling. Um, it enforces compatibility of the discretization weekly using Lagrangian multipliers, so it's a, it's a mixed discretization. And if you go through this, um, you know, there's a really nice formulation. There's some care to be taken to um, you know, design all the uh, spaces to satisfy the LBB or in scoop conditions. So obviously there's some nuances with that. But um, you know, they, they have a really nice method that, that they, they've developed with nice results. Um, unfortunately, we weren't able to make use of this method for our, some of our production problems because it really proved to be too difficult to implement into some of our um, existing HPC codes. And so that was really kind of the, the main motivation for the present work, which was aimed at developing a method that would achieve some of these properties like the concurrent code, but that would be um, easier for us to put into some of the codes that um, we're using for some of our um, mission spaces. So um, that brings me to um, our uh, list of requirements or, or kind of wish list of properties for our multi-scale coupling method. Uh, I already for, talked about the first two bullets. so. We want the coupling to be concurrent or two-way. Uh, we want the method to be easy to implement into some of our existing massively parallel HPC codes. Um, the third bullet, we want the method to be scalable, fast, and robust on real engineering problems that we're targeting. So um, you know, this isn't a case where we're just trying to develop a method to write a paper on it. We actually want um, the method to be impactful in our mission spaces, so we want the method to go into our um, production codes for analysts to use them and you know, for the method to you know, either enable them to do, solve problems faster or, or you know, solve more problems than they're currently able to solve with existing methods. Um, we're looking for a method that would provide what I'm going to call a plug-and-play framework that would simplify the task of meshing complex geometry. So I'll um, kind of explain this in the context of this picture at the bottom. So um, this is kind of representative of some of the problems that we're um, we're looking at solving, so a lot of problems that um, are held together by fasteners. So here we have these, um, these bolts. 
And you know, you can imagine this can be a lot more complicated than, than this picture with you know, lots more bolts all over the place, lots more multi-scale components. Um, and um, when you have a very complex geometry like this, just, just meshing this can be incredibly challenging. So it can take weeks to mesh one of these things and requires a lot of meshing expertise. Um, and so even though the meshing operation is kind of a pre-processing step, if you're looking to um, you know, study a lot of different design configurations, let's say, this can actually be a big bottleneck that can prevent you from doing a lot of analyses that you may want to do. So we're looking for a method that would allow us to take a multi-scale geometry, decompose it into you know, the, the large scales and the small scales, um, and then kind of glue them together um, and, and allow you to mesh the, the, the different components separately. And it, it, with this framework, you know, if you want to change the mesh or if you want to change slightly one of these components, you can just um, you know, regenerate that mesh separately and, and kind of plug it into your, your framework and, and redo the simulation very easily. Um, so with that, we want a method that would allow us to couple regions with different non-conformal meshes, different element types, different levels of refinement, um, also allow us to use different solvers and time integrators in different regions. Uh, of course, we don't want uh, the coupling to introduce any non-physical artifacts. And then ideally, um, the method would have um, some theoretical convergence property or guarantee. Um, so, uh, as the title suggests, we're proposing to do this coupling here using the Schwartz alternating method. So, um, I, I would guess that most people are at least somewhat familiar with this method, but let me kind of quickly go through how this uh, works. Um, so, the, the method uh, was proposed in 1870 by Herman Schwartz for solving the Laplace equation on irregular domains. It's, um, I think, the earliest known domain decomposition method. Uh, it's based on a really simple idea. Namely, if you want to solve a problem on a complex domain, you decompose that domain into simpler subdomains, and then you use those uh, solutions in the simpler subdomains to iteratively build a solution on the more complex domain. Okay. Um, so Schwartz was doing this before computers. Um, he was just um, analytically trying to derive these solutions. But um, you know, in the 20th century, uh, when computers came came about, obviously people tried to um, you know really make make use of this method to speed up computation. Uh, so uh, I'll just go through kind of very quickly how this works in the context of this um, canonical two-domain example. So I'll, I'll use this throughout the presentation. This is without a lot of generality, so you can have you know, more more sophisticated domains, and you, you can have more than two domains as well. But let's say we have the uh, domain comprised of this circle and rectangle. Okay. So the way the method works, you're going to start by solving your PD in the in the circle, omega one. You're going to use the boundary conditions that are prescribed on the outer boundary. Uh, on this inner boundary, gamma one. Um, you can use the arbitrary boundary condition to get this started. Uh, you then go to omega-2. Um, you're again going to solve your PD in omega-2. Use prescribed boundary conditions on the outer boundary. And now on this inner boundary, gamma-2, you um, take your solution from omega-1, um, interpolate it onto gamma-2, um, and use that as the boundary condition. Okay. And then you go back to omega-1, and you repeat. Now, you know, from gamma-1, you're going to have information from omega-2 rather than something arbitrary. Um, and so this continues until the solutions match to some tolerance within the overlap region. And typically the information is propagating through the boundary conditions in this formulation. And so um, not surprisingly, um, since your, uh, your convergence criterion has to do with um, the solutions being the same in the overlap region, the overlap region needs to be non-empty. Uh, and um, uh, kind of as you would expect, the larger the overlap region, the fewer iterations this will converge in. So if you have 100% overlap, you're going to converge in one iteration, but you're not really doing Schwartz. You're just solving your you know, single domain problem twice, basically. So that, that wouldn't be something you'd want to do. Um, there would be a kind of an optimal size for that for a given problem, but overlap region. Um, so where this method commonly comes up is in the linear solver literature, um, where it's used um, very often as a preconditioner for Karlov iterative methods for solving linear algebraic equations. Um, the new idea behind um, our particular work um, that I'm presenting today is to use the method as a discretization method for solving multi-scale PDEs. Okay. And this is something that, um, you know, even though it's a very natural thing to try to do, um, not very many people had looked at this prior to kind of us starting this work and certainly not at the, the scales that we're interested in. So um, if you like memes, <laughs> uh, my uh, uh, co-author Alejandro likes memes, so he made the slide. Um, you know, we're kind of scoffing it using the method as a preconditioner and instead advocating using the method as a, um, a sort of solver for, for a couple of fully nonlinear um, PDs. Okay. All right, so that's the, the background. Um, there's no questions in the chat, so I'll um, 
I'll continue to the next section. Um, so, like I said, the, the first kind of part, uh, main part of the talk is going to focus on um, kind of formulating the method and discussing some of its properties for quasi-static problems and solid mechanics. Um, so let me kind of jump right into it here. Um, the top of the slide shows the algorithm for um, using Schwartz for quasi-static coupling. Um, so before I go through this, let me kind of back up a little bit. And since I don't know what everyone's background is online, um, uh, just to kind of give a little bit of a background of how quasi-statics work. So this is a common approach in, in solid mechanics, um, quasi-static uh, kind of advancement of your system. Um, essentially, the idea is um, you have a steady PDE, and you're going to solve a, a sequence of steady PDEs. And with each new PDE that you're solving, you're going to um, increment or augment the load that's being applied to the system. Okay, so. Um, you're sort of emulating dynamics in some sense without having a DDT term um, in your equations, and um, you can um, you know, potentially uh, avoid some, some challenges that happen with dynamics like CFL conditions by using this, this type of an approach. Um, so uh, the, the Schwartz algorithm is at the top here for the case of quasi-statics. You have an outer quasi-static loop that's going to do this, um, this uh, increment, incrementing of the load that's being applied. And then within this loop, you're going to have your, your Schwartz loop. And so this is exactly the algorithm I explained a few slides back, just written in mathematical notation, where you're basically solving back and forth between the two or more domains. You have information propagating through the boundaries. And then you, um, uh, you don't go to the next quasi-static step until you've converted the, Newton, uh, sorry, the Schwartz step, um, which uh, is based on how much the solutions match in the overlap region. Um, so you can imagine, you know, this is a, there's a number of advantages for this kind of coupling. It's conceptually very simple. Um, so you just write this down in a few lines, um, explain it in just a few 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 sentences. Um, simple to understand. Um, also kind of easy to put into a code. Um, you know, just kind of stick in this extra loop inside your um, quasi-static loop that you already have in there. Um, it allows you to couple different uh, regions with different non-conformal meshes, different element types, different levels of refinement. Um, you're getting the concurrent coupling because um, your information is propagating between both of the domains through the boundaries. Um, you can use different solvers in different regions. You can use different material models in different regions under some conditions that I'll, I'll talk about a little bit later on. And then um, this, this achieves this, this goal of uh, simplifying the task of meshing complex geometries at different scales, since you can just mesh the different domains separately and kind of glue them together using the method. So um, another uh, advantage, as it turns out, is that this is based on a very solid theoretical foundation. So just a little bit of a history of some of the theory that's been done for Schwartz. And um, one thing that's interesting is uh, the, the theory depends on the PDE that you're looking at. So kind of as you go um, down this list, um, you know, start with very simple linear problems and go, go to more sophisticated problems with time. So um, Sobolev posed the method for linear elasticity. Um, 1936 proved the method's convergence. 1951, Michelin uh, proved convergence of the method for general linear elliptic PDEs. Um, in the 80s, uh, Leon really did some um, kind of seminal work to try to get the method back on the map, um, including um, you know, applying the method and formulating the method for nonlinear problems and um, proving convergence for nonlinear monotone elliptic problems. Um, and then uh, you know, if you fast forward a few more decades, um, we had a paper uh, three year, or four years ago now, 2021 already, uh, in 2017, in which we proved convergence of the alternating Schwartz method for finite deformation quasi-static nonlinear PDEs. Um, so I'll show the reference on the next slide. Um, these are basically um, you know, steady mechanics problems that are um, uh, defined by this energy functional phi. Um, so uh, kind of for non-mechanics um, folks out there, um, this is kind of defining the weak form of your problem. And um, you have uh, here your... Um, Helmholtz free energy density, and embedded in this, you have a material model, and so this can um, really vary from um, you know, simple linear elasticity to, to much more sophisticated models. So um, just to uh, say a few words about the, um, the theory. Uh, so uh, this is a, a, the theorem that we have in our paper, which is cited at the bottom from 2017. Um, the conditions for convergence of the method is that the single domain problem be well posed and that the overlap region be um, non empty. And uh, I'm not going to go through how we prove this because it takes about eight pages in the paper, so that's what's in the background here. But essentially, the idea is we construct a sequence of solutions, this uh, curly phi tilde n, 
Um, and we show that, it, uh, that if we apply the Schwartz iteration to the sequence, um, we're going to converge to a unique, unique minimizer of the energy functional capital fee, um, and that the, mon the convergence is okay. um, And so we, we leverage some of the analysis work done by some of the folks here, um, you know, Sobolev, Miklin, Leon, Babushka as well, um, to, to, to prove this. Okay. Uh, so um, let me show, uh, kind of towards showing some, some examples, let me talk a little bit about implementation. Um, so like I said, uh, uh, at the beginning, we, we've implemented this method in two codes. Um, for the quasi-static uh, case, I'm only going to show results from one of the codes, but we actually um, have done all the problems that I'm showing in, in both of the codes. So, so there's really, it's just for kind of brevity to um, you know, not, not show duplicate results. Um, so the first code uh, that, that I'll be showing results for is, is called Albany LCM. Um, so let me say a little few words about what, what this code, um, what, what, how this code works. So this is an open source parallel C++ multi-physics finite element code. It's available uh, on GitHub at the URL you see here on the right. Uh, it has a number of uh, salient features. It has a component-based design that enables uh, rapid development of new physics and capabilities. So the components here are primarily at Trilino's libraries. These are also open source um, developed at Sandia, um, kind of the bread and butter work for um, the Center for Computing Research at Sandia. Um, and then uh, Albany houses what we call LCM, which is Laboratory for Computational Mechanics. And, um, this is a kind of a suite that contains a, a wide variety of constitutive models that range from you know, simple linear elasticity all the way to very sophisticated microstructure models like crystal plasticity. Um, and so uh, just in terms of the, the role of Albany, so Albany um, is actually both production code and a um, kind of a sandbox code depending on the application. So we have a, um, a Landice model called um, Albany Landice living in, in this code that's hooked up to the DOE um, energy exascalar system model that some of you online may be familiar with. So for that application, it's a production code. For the solid mechanics um, application, uh, we have another production code called Sierra that I'll talk about later on. So um, here, the role of Albany was related to kind of prototype the method. And once we, um, we got the method working well and, and kind of prototyped in Albany, we went ahead and put it into our production code Sierra. So currently it's in both of the codes. Um, the last thing I wanted to say here was about um, the detail of the implementation. So um, one of the things that's not entirely trivial in the implementation of the method is um, uh, how you would do the search and interpolation when you're going from one domain onto the boundary of the other subdomain. And in particular, this is not entirely trivial to do in, in parallel. And so for this, we're relying on a library called DGK Data Transfer Kit. Um, this is out of Oak Ridge National Lab. Um, and this is a really nice kind of easy to use library that um, uh, we were able to integrate into the code pretty quickly and um, that uh, gives us a really scalable kind of fast Im Im implementation that I'll, I'll show some results for later on. Okay. So uh, numerical examples. So I'm gonna I'm gonna show um, four examples here, and these are gonna start with um, you know very simple proof of concept problems, just to kind of verify the method, verify some of its properties, and then go, go all the way to sort of production-like problems. So the first example is really really simple. Um, I call this the cuboid problem. Um, we have the coupling of two cuboids with a square base shown at the top. The the goal here is to look at what happens with the method as we change the um, level of refinement in each of these cuboids, and um, we, also, we also change the size of the overlap region. Um, we're going to put a new Hookian type of material model here, which is a um, nonlinear elastic material model, and we're going to pull on this from the top the stretch. Um, so uh, I'll, let, me, let me show a few results for this. Um, the first thing I actually wanted to talk through is this picture at the bottom. So this just gives you um, some intuition about how the Schwartz iteration works. So basically, initially, you have some error in the overlap region. Um, and then, you know, as the iterations progress, this error eventually will get corrected. Um, so that's just kind of some intuition about how the iteration and the method work. Um, so uh, first result has to do with um, looking at convergence as you change the overlap and the level of refinement in the, in the cuboids. Um, so the, the left side here, um, this is looking at convergence for uh, different mesh sizes and a fixed overlap volume fraction, which is the size of the overlap region. Um, this is plotting essentially kind of errors into subsequent Schwartz iterations, um, and so, so that the, the slope of this line is, is the convergence uh, rate, and you can see we get a, um, a linear convergence rate, and that, that result is consistent with our theoretical results that we derived in that paper that I mentioned. 
Uh, on the right, we're looking at what happens as you um, change the size of the overlap region, so the overlap volume fraction. And so um, we're plotting in this in this plot um, what we call the convergence fraction of mu, so it's kind of the ratio of errors in two, um, two, two subsequent iterations. Um, and there's a lot of stuff happening here in the in the legend, but just just to I'll just give you the main conclusion from this. What this this reveals is that we get a, um, a faster linear convergence as we increase the size of the overlap volume fraction. So you know the larger the overlap, the fewer iterations you'll converge in. That's again kind of consistent with the theory and with what you would um, intuitively expect to happen. Um, we can also compute errors. So we computed errors with respect to a reference solution in each of the cuboids. Uh, displacement errors are basically uh, machine precision. In the stresses, the errors are um, you know, 10 to the minus 13. Um, so you're really not getting any error introduced by the, the coupling. Um, so that was a really simple problem. So let's now go to a, a more sophisticated problem. So this is what I call the notch cylinder problem. Um, here's our geometry uh, in the left two pictures, um, the notch cylinder. We're going to stretch this um, along the axial direction from the top and the bottom. And again, it's going to kind of stretch like the cuboid. Um, again, we use this new Hokian type of material model, which is um, an elastic nonlinear model. Um, so the natural thing to do here for a domain decomposition would be to make this um, middle domain, uh, uh, middle, middle region one domain, um, and then the, the rest of this be uh, second domain. Um, this is actually one domain. We, we only solve this on an eighth of this for use symmetry, using symmetry conditions. So uh, if there's any confusion there, that, that's, that's the reason for this being just one domain. Um, but um, so the, the natural thing you'd want to do here it would be to put a really fine mesh in the middle, since that's where um, you know all the kind of action is expected to happen with the simulation. And then we're going to put a relatively coarse mesh um, away from this, this middle part. And so we're going to look at coupling different um, different element types. And uh, so we're going to put uh, tet elements here and couple those to hex elements um, away from the middle. And you can see the resolutions are quite different from the meshes. Um, so this is a movie um, that shows you what happens. So I have the displacement magnitude on the left, um, one of the Cauchy stress components on the right. And this is a really large deformation problem, I should mention. Um, and so you can see, you know, you get a nice smooth solution with information um, propagating, um, you know, correctly uh, between the, the, the two domains. Oops, okay. Um, so that was kind of an eyeball norm uh, statement. So we can also quantify this. Um, this is reporting errors in the, in the displacement. The errors are about 0.1%. Now, um, what's kind of interesting here is uh, if you visualize the errors, you can actually see that most of the errors uh, here are not coming from the coupling. So um, if you look at the, the errors, um, just plot, plot in these two pictures, kind of most of the errors where you see the curvature in the domain. And if you think about this, it actually makes sense what's happening. So this is a curved geometry. Our reference uh, solution that we're computing errors with respect to is, is shown here. Um, I guess the wrong side of it, but but this is um, a much finer mesh, so it's able to better represent this this curved geometry. So what you're seeing in, in most of this error is actually just geometric error um, that you would you would have with a, just a standard fine element discretization. So, so it's not really due to the coupling at all. Um, okay. So uh, we also, as I mentioned earlier, we we also are able to couple different uh, material models under some conditions. Let me um, kind of show that on an example. Uh, so this is the same problem or variant of the same problem. We're going to put an elastic uh, material model in the coarse region, elastic plastic material model in the fine region. Um, we have hex meshes, meshes now, but that, that doesn't matter for the illustration. Um, so essentially uh, what you need to do when you're um, doing different material models, you need to be a little bit careful to do the domain decomposition so that the material models are consistent in the overlap region. Okay. So this is showing two domain decompositions, a good one on the left and a, and a bad one on the right. So in the good one, the overlap is, is far from the notch. There's no plastic deformation in it. So you get a nice smooth solution. So, so you kind of get everything, the, the coarse and fine regions are predicting the same behavior in the overlap. So everything is kind of good here. Um, if you put the overlap too close to the notch, um, plastic deformation will spill onto the overlap region. The, the models predict different behavior, and you can have an adverse effect on convergence. Um, so, you know, you do see some artifacts here. And um, the, the theory we have assumes the same material model. Uh, I do think that it can be extended if you have some compatibility in the overlap region, but this just shows you that, um, you know, you, you do need to take a little bit of care to sort of design the, the domain decomposition in the right way, especially when you're having different material models. And that's kind of an ongoing research area, actually, how to do that in general. Um, so uh, moving towards production-like problems, example three is a laser weld problem. 
So here we're looking at um, a couple of more than two domains just to illustrate that that's possible to do. Um, so we have three subdomains in red, gray, and, and green here, um, coupling isotropic elasticity with J2 plasticity. Um, we're able to get about a 50% reduction in the model size here relative to a single domain discretization um, while keeping the error uh, to the same tolerance. And um, one of the objectives of this problem was also to look at the scaling of this, to look at the scaling, strong scaling um, with this parallel implementation that uses ETK. Um, so you can see we get a near ideal speed up, linear speed up for, for this problem for several different mesh resolutions that we were considering. Um, so then the last problem is, is kind of a, a, our production problem or the one that I chose to highlight. We have others as well that we've done. Um, this is a work uh, by um, some of my colleagues at, at Sandia, um, Coleman Allman, Jay Folk, uh, Dave Littlewood, and Guy Bergell. And I think this is an interesting problem because it um, illustrates a really interesting use case of the method, namely that the method can be used as part of a homogenization or upscaling process to bridge the gap between microscopic and macroscopic regions. Okay. So um, here's the, the idea. So we have this um, tensile geometry. Um, we're going to embed in it this microstructure in the middle. The, the goal here is, is, to, is to study strain localization within the microstructure. Um, and so kind of the, the motivation for the upscaling is basically, if you can think of this microstructure model as a very detailed model, that you're not going to be able to afford to use everywhere in the domain. Okay. So um, we're going to take this model and we're going to couple it to a simpler model. So we're going to couple this crystal plasticity model for the microstructure to a, a J2 plasticity model for the rest of this, that's our macro scale model. Um, you're going to use, the, use Schwartz to do that coupling, and we're going to try to inform the macro scale model using the microstructure information. That's what I mean by um, upscaling, for those who aren't familiar with that. Um, so uh, what we're doing, what we're going to do is we, um, or I guess not we, Coleman did, did the study. Um, he uh, prescribed an ensemble of uniaxial loads to the structure. Um, he, he had 10 uh, ensembles of this crystal plasticity model. So you can see them here on this plot um, that's showing cool plastic strain and, and stress. And basically, he just fit the, the J2 plasticity model to the set of ensemble to do the, the upscaling. So um, this is, I think, a really neat kind of powerful um, use for the method. Um, so with that, I'll kind of end the quasi-static part. So let me see. Um, uh, I don't know. Do we want to take a couple questions now, or should I just save them all for the end? Um, it's up to you, Irina. We have oh. a, a two questions, I, I believe, yeah. or three or two. It's up to you. So I'm looking at that. Maybe I'll wait until the end because I think these are kind of more broad questions rather than um, rather than ones that are specific to the quasi stack. So let's let's maybe just wait until the end. That that way I'll, I'll be sure to get through everything. And, um, that sounds good. That sounds good. Are. Okay. Okay. So um, so the last part here um, is going to be on dynamics. So essentially, um, a few years a few years back after we kind of got good results for the quasi statics case, we we moved on to extend the method to dynamics, and so. Um, again, I'll uh, um, kind of start with a little bit of a, a motivation here. So we um, uh, we did a literature search when we started this work for dynamics. Um, we uh, there, there were some Schwartz-like methods out there that we came across. Most of these were based on space-time discretizations, um, where you basically treat time as an auxiliary spatial dimension. Uh, and so, um, you know, as with everything, there's some advantages and some disadvantages. So this lets you use um, non-matching meshes in different time steps in different regions, which is what we ultimately want to do. Um, unfortunately, um, you know, again, uh, our methods, really, our, our codes aren't really um, designed to work well with, you know, to, to be, to, to, to allow space-time methods to be easily integrated into them. So these kinds of this flavor of methods really weren't feasible for us given the design of our codes and the size of the simulations that we're running. Um, so uh, that prompted us to develop a, kind of our own um, formulation of Schwartz for dynamics that will work from with more traditional discretization methods where you first discretize in space and discretize in time. Um, so let me kind of talk through how this works. So kind of the main ingredients are as follows. So you have your domain decomposition like before. Um, you're going to have discretizations in each of these domains. You're going to have discretizations in space and, and also in time. And so just like the Spatial discretizations don't need to be the same. The temporal discretizations also don't need to be the same. And, and the time steps don't need to be the same. Um, the last ingredient are shown in blue. So I call this the controller time stepper. And the, the idea here is basically just define some global time steps at which you're going to synchronize your subdomains. And this just um, basically gives you a way to um, 
you know, have the, the method converge for, for a small, uh, relatively small time step without having to go all the way to the end of your simulation before checking for convergence and synchronizing the domains. And hopefully that will become clear as I go through the, the algorithm. So um, here's how this goes. So you, you initialize the first controller time step. Um, you're going to um, take your solution omega 1. You're going to advance from T0 to MT1. Um, in doing that, you're going to need information from omega 2 on gamma 1. And notice that this is going to need interpolation in um, space, uh, but, but also potentially in time. So if, if your omega 2 uses different time steps, you're going to need to interpolate onto this boundary in time as well. That's an important detail. Uh, you then go to omega 2. Um, you're going to repeat. Again, you're going to need to interpolate from omega 1 to gamma 2 in um, space and potentially in time. Uh, when both of the domains have reached time t1, you're going to check for convergence. Um, and um, if the method is not converged, you return to step one and you repeat. If the method is converged, you go to the next controller time step and you repeat. Okay. And so, um, again, I, I emphasize you can use different integrators, different time steps within each uh, domain. Um, there's an important detail here that when we, we found that when we do this interpolation, um, it was important to actually interpolate not just the displacement, but also the velocity and the acceleration for the dynamics case. Um, in order to kind of get the best results. So that, that was kind of an important, another important detail. Um, if you're using different different time steps, you do need to um, kind of take some care to store the solution at different time steps and, and have the capability to interpolate the solution in time. So it's another kind of important detail. Um, oh, how do I make this go away again? Ah, shoot. Okay. Ah, there it goes. Um, so a little bit about theory like before. So like for the quasi-static case, um, we're able to show convergence under some conditions. Um, the conditions are similar. Uh, we can show convergence if the problem, single domain problem is well posed and the overlap region is not empty. We also have some conditions on the time step delta t. Um, so, you know, the details can be found in this paper at the bottom that we submitted a few months back to Kamami. Um, just to kind of sketch out how we prove this, we uh, look at the action functional s, which is the integral of the Lagrangian over space and time. Um, we want this to be strictly convex or strictly concave. And we study this by looking at the second variation of the action functional. And so, um, you know, skipping all the details here, what we're able to show is uh, if we use a Newmark time integration scheme, which is the usual time integration scheme that's used for these problems. Um, for the fully discrete problems, here's how our uh, second variation of the action functional looks like. So, um, M is the mass matrix, K is the stiffness matrix, gamma and beta are Newmark parameters, and delta T is the time step. And basically, if you kind of stare at this for a while, you can see. Um, this can always be made positive if you choose a sufficiently small delta t. Okay. Um, and so this is something you could check for a given discretization. Uh, and um, what we found in our numerical experiments is that usually the time step requirements for um, stability and accuracy will automatically lead to satisfaction of those bounds. Okay. So um, let me let me show examples again. So um, uh, more on implementation. So I, I mentioned earlier, um, we have this other code Sierra solid mechanics that I haven't talked about yet. So let me let me talk about that. So um, for the dynamics case, I'm going to show results in Albany LCM that I already covered, and, and also the Sierra code. Um, so what is Sierra? Uh, it's a Sandia Lagrangian 3D code for the finite element analysis of solids and structures. Um, has a lot of different um, suites or components that are shown in this um, picture. Um, we're using just a few of them. We're using Adagio and Presto for um, quasi-statics and implicit explicit dynamics. So um, uh, like I said before, we, we have quasi-statics in Sierra. I just, just happened not to show those results in this presentation. Um, and then the other the other piece that we're using is, is not in this picture, um, but it's in Sierra. It's called Arpeggio. And so Arpeggio is um, a loose coupling framework that exists in Sierra. Um, it was designed for multi-physics coupling, like um, basically doing thermomechanical coupling, for instance. Um, but we were able to, to hijack this framework to do the Schwartz implementation. And what was really um, a pleasant surprise for us is we actually did not have to write any code in Sierra uh, to implement Schwartz. So we were just able to use that arpeggio coupling and basically create input files for the coupling to um, perform all the steps of the, of the Schwartz method as I described it for both the quasi-statics and the dynamics. So that was kind of... Um, Really, a very pleasant surprise for us because we didn't really want to, you know, get, get too deep into into CR, which is a very big, uh, complex code. Uh, so again, examples. So I'll show three this time. Um, again, they'll go from proof of concept all the way to production type problems. Um, first problem, like before, is really simple. This is um, elastic wave propagation problem. 
We have a linear elastic clamped beam with a Gaussian initial condition. So this is the beam. Here's the initial condition in blue. Uh, it's for the Z displacement. Um, this is going to kind of split into two Gaussians and, and reflect off the wall and eventually give this mirror image Gaussian. I'll, I'll show a movie in the next slide. Um, it's a really simple problem. It has an exact analytical solution, but um, it turns out it's a very stringent test for um, discretization methods. Um, and so we're going to look at two subdomains, one from 0 to 0 0.75, one from 0.25 to 1. Um, we're going to look at all kinds of different couplings, so implicit, explicit, um, hex tet, and, and so on. So I'll uh, show some results. So this is looking at a um, variety of different couplings with the same delta T, but, but different, um, different time integrators and different discretization. So there's a couple of movies here. I'll play them as I talk. Um, so this is showing the Z displacement, Z velocity. Uh, red and green are the Schwartz solutions, and then blue is the single domain solution. And so as this plays, you can see the solutions pretty much match the entire um, time. And um, you know there there are some oscillations here and there, but if you see those in the single domain solutions, and this is some, some dispersion from the time integration scheme. Um, so that's that's not an artifact that that comes out of the Schwartz. So um, we're not seeing any artifacts that are pervasive in other coupling methods. And again, this is an eyeball norm statement. So you, we can um, make this more rigorous by computing errors with respect to the exact solution. So these are summarized in the table for different couplings. Um, CM is uh, consistent mass, LM is lumped mass, so that's um, uh, with the lump, lumping you, you get a little bit less accurate solution. But um, basically these numbers are comparable to what you would have with um, coupling with uh, a single domain discretization having a comparable um, time step and, and spatial resolution. And um, that uh, preprint paper has, um, has those results. I, I didn't include them here, but I refer you to the paper if you'd like to um, verify that. Uh, so um, a little bit of performance data, even though it's a really simple problem. Um, so this is showing uh, number of sh maximum and average number of Schwartz iterations during a run for different couplings with different um, Schwartz tolerances. So um, really, I just wanted to point out that the Schwartz tolerance is something that you can um, use as a knob. So you know, as you as you tighten the Schwartz tolerance, um, the number of iterations required to converge will go up, as you would expect. Um, uh, you know, if you loosen it, it goes down. So you know, if your um, if your method is too slow, you could try to loosen the tolerance to get it to go faster. If you feel like it's not accurate enough, you could tighten the tolerance. So that's that's a that's a knob that one has. In addition to the size of the overlap region, um, it's kind of fun for this to look at how the number of iterations changes in time. So you know, initially um, when uh, kind of you don't really need the two domains to to communicate because the Gaussian isn't just you know one of them, uh, or sorry, the Gaussian is not in the in the overlap region. You're converging in just just two iterations, and then you know as the Gaussian kind of hits the overlap region, this this goes up. Um, you know, you're back to back to two when kind of nothing is really happening, and you don't really need the domains to to communicate so much, and then goes back up um, when you get the mirror image of the Gaussian in the, in the overlap region. Um, so that that last example, I had the same delta t um, throughout. Um, one of the the advantages of the method is it allows you to use different delta t's as well, which would be Something you may want to do if you're coupling implicit and explicit steppers, since um, you should be able to use a much um, larger time step in the implicit domain than the explicit one. So let's let's see what happens there. So here we have um, an implicit stepper coupled to an explicit stepper, drastically different time steps. So one e minus two in the explicit domain, two e minus seven in the, in the sorry, one e minus two in the implicit domain, two e minus seven in the explicit domain. And these are the, the few of the solutions superimposed over each other. And there's also a single domain solution here that you can't see since everything, um, they're all kind of on top of each other. So again, you're, you're not, um, you know, everything is indistinguishable. The short solutions are indistinguishable from the single domain and the analytic solution. So um, we're not seeing any artifacts even in the case of different, drastically different time steps. Um, so the last two examples are um, kind of more, more production-like examples. So they're from our production code Sierra. Uh, this is a tension specimen problem, so it's a little bit similar to um, the notch cylinder uh, kind of in, in setup. Um, we have a uniaxial aluminum cylindrical tensile specimen so here. We have now um, an inelastic J2 material model, which has a lot of these internal variables that need to be um, kind of dealt with um, correctly. That was a little bit of a challenge to, to do that correctly um, within the Albany implementation we were doing it. Um, so uh, we're going to decompose this into two subdomains. That we'll, I'll call them the ends and the gauge. Um, we're going to put a fine uh, high-order 10-node tetrahedral mesh in the gauge, couple that to a um, 
uh, hex mesh uh, away from or in the ends, as I call them. And this, um, this, this mesh that we're using here, this is a special element we developed for solid mechanics that's called the, the composite um, uh, 10 node tetrahedron. Um, we're going to use implicit uh, time stepping for this, um, and we're going to put a really slight imperfection exactly in the middle of this, so that when we when we pull on this from both ends, which will be the um, the, the the loading applied, um, we're, this is going to neck exactly in the middle. Um, so for the kind of non-solid mechanics folks, this is um, what I mean by the necking and kind of what we expect for the results. So initially, you're in this elastic strain region. Um, this is just going to kind of stretch without having um, kind of a noticeable deformation. Um, eventually, you're going to get um, into this plastic strain region. You're going to see this necking behavior, so it's going to get very thin in the middle, and eventually you're going to get a fracture there. So here's what we get for the simulation. Um, this is wide displacement on the left, equivalent plastic strain on the right. Um, you get this necking behavior in the middle, um, and we're able to um, converge in just three short iterations per time step, so this is quite, um, quite, quite small. Um, some more eye candy, kind of the same result, just um, visualized differently. Um, Google plastic strain again. You can see how it changes based on which domain you're in. Uh, and then um, Cauchy stress as well. So um, you know the stress is maximal in the middle, so that's going to tell you that this is where the fracture is going to happen, which is what you would, you would expect. Let's see, oh, okay, I'm good on time. Um, so uh, last example, um, so this is what I call the, the bolted joint problem. And this is where I kind of started, and so this is where I wanted to, um, to end as well. Um, so I already kind of presented this geometry and some of the motivation. Um, this is really representative of some of the problems we want to solve. So we have a, a group of folks that um, they're called the fastener group, and so they're they're interested in um, you know, modeling these these um, geometries that have bolts and other fasteners kind of holding pieces together, which are very relevant to some of the um, the NW mission spaces that that they work on. Um, this is the kind of an innocuous example of it, though. So this is our um, uh, our computational domain on the left is an example of where you might see this in the real world. This is a lamppost. Um, so we're going to decompose this into the small and the large scales. Um, the, the small scales are the bolts. We're going to put a uh, composite to 10 mesh in the bolts, um, couple that to a hex mesh in the remainder of this, which I'll call the, the parts. Um, we're again using this, this inelastic G2 material model in both of the domains we have. Uh, the bolts are steel. The the um, the parts have a steel component and an aluminum component as well. Um, so let's let's see what happens. So we're going to apply an x displacement, so from left to right, and this, this to this geometry. So here's what what happens. Um, single domain solution is on the left. A short solution is on the right. Single domain solution is on an all composite tet ten mesh because you actually can't mesh this with just hexes um, if, it's, if if you're not doing the you know something like Schwartz because of the, the bolts being so kind of detailed. Um, and so I call this the um, backing into a pole problem. So uh, it's supposed to be uh, a joke, but <laughs> can't, can't tell online if, if people are laughing. But essentially, I, I came, came across this deformed configuration at San Francisco parking garage. So, um, uh, you know, so someone, someone did this experiment. Uh, it wasn't me, <laughs> for the record. Uh, I was quite happy that I could compare to some um, experimental, uh, you know, quote unquote experimental results. I'm sure they, they weren't quite so happy when they did this to their car. But uh, in any case, you, you can see, you know, some of this behavior, like the lifting of the, you know, this part and this part, you actually see that in the, in the simulation and the single domain and short solutions are um, essentially the, the same. Uh, can also look at equivalent plastic strain in the bolts. Um, so, you know, you can see these things are kind of getting sheared, and, and I think eventually the top part will probably pop off if we continue this. Um, very much of interest is some, some, some results about sort of convergence and performance. So um, convergence rate for this problem, so we, we plotted errors into subsequent iterations. Um, we get a linear convergence rate for this, which is comparable to what we had for the um, quasi-static uh, case that I showed. And then um, I think this is very interesting. This is some data about performance. So we had um, four different uh, discretizations here. So the first two have the single domain in Schwartz. They have a comparable number of uh, elements in the bolts. And then the second two also have a comparable number of elements in the, in the bolts. And, and the meshes are finer here, essentially, for the bolts. So um, there's some interesting results here. So first, if you look at the first two lines, you can see excuse me, that even though the Schwartz method is iterative, it can actually be faster than the single domain run um, for patients having a comparable number of elements in the bolts. And that's actually kind of surprising because it is an iterative method, so you would think that it would be slower. But I think what's happening here is, is basically you're 
single domain problems are easier to solve than your coupled problem. And then that together with the fact that we're not converging in very many iterations causes this to be more, um, to, to be faster. Um, the story is different if you look at the second two lines here. So here, um, Schwartz kind of loses, it's slower than the single domain problem. Um, but I emphasize that, um, you know, the, the method may still be preferred for its ability to rapidly change and evaluate a variety of engineering designs, which is our typical use case at, at Sandia. And we're actually still trying to kind of understand, you know, when the method, quote unquote, wins versus not, what kinds of problems with the help of some of these analysts that I mentioned who are running these um, bolted joint type problems. Um, the other thing I already alluded to, so this is converging in a very small number of iterations between two and four. That's actually a little bit surprising because the overlap region here is really tiny. So I didn't show it before, but it's just this region around the bolts. So that was a little, little bit curious that, that it's still so fast, even though the overlap is so small. Um, so that's, uh, and again, how do I make the top up? Uh, I don't know how to make this go away. Ah, okay, well, I guess it's okay. Uh, let's see. So, so let, me, um, let me kind of wrap up. Um, so I, I talked about the Schwartz method um, and its development at Sandia for uh, concurrent multi-scale coupling in quasi-statics and dynamics. Um, I've talked about implementation of the method in two codes, Albany LCM and Star Solid Mechanics. Um, we get all of these requirements that I mentioned at the beginning, so the concurrent coupling, ease of implementation, scale, method being scalable, fast, and robust, um, creating a plug-and-play framework um, with the method that simplifies task and meshing complex geometries, um, numerical artifacts, and theoretical convergence properties. Um, so I just wanted to end by saying a few words about what we're still doing with the method. So we're still very much involved in this work. So current, current work is, is, is centered on um, continuing to apply the method to problems of interest to production using mostly CR solid mechanics at this point within Sandia. Um, I, I would invite, um, so I, I believe, uh, I'm not sure if, if Lawrence Livermore folks can use Sierra, but certainly the Albany LCM implementation is open source. So if anyone is interested in um, giving that a try, um, you know, we're definitely willing to work with you guys to, to help you, you know, set up the code and set up the types of problems that you want to um, to run, you know, to hopefully make use of the method to, to, simple, to, to help some of your computations as well. Um, where uh, we've done a little bit of work on trying to advance the method to couple structural elements to continuum elements, so the structural elements would be like um, shell elements, for instance. Um, and, and then the big task uh, as of um, this fiscal year is um, we're developing a Schwartz-like algorithm for simulating contact to address some of the well-known challenges in uh, numerical simulation of contact, so things like um, contact constraint enforcement, the multiple scales that are involved, and just to give you some flavor, um, we're, for this, we're looking at a non-overlapping formulation, kind of like this. Um, and so for that, you need to change the transmission conditions. You need either alternating Dirichlet-Neumann or Robin-Robin type of conditions. Um, and so a big part of this research is going to be kind of understanding what are the optimal conditions to use in this non-overlapping framework for the, for the contact application. Um, and then this is just kind of a further down the line. So it's a little bit of kind of my vision for this, ultimately. Um, so I, I think, um, you know, developing a multi-physics coupling framework for this method would be um, very interesting and useful where you could do, um, you can imagine different kinds of multi-physics coupling. You could do things with total overlap like thermomechanical coupling or no overlap like um, fluid structure interaction. Um, and I think uh, this, this picture really kind of summarizes the vision where um, ultimately the method can also be used to um, provide a rigorous coupling framework for conventional and data-driven models. So um, I would imagine, you know, uh, coupling finite element and finite volume type models, let's say, with um, reduced models or even neural networks, so projection-based or disorder models or things like physics-informed neural networks where you have potentially different models or different physics and different subdomains, and you have this Schwartz glue kind of holding everything together. Um, so obviously for this, you know, these transmission conditions are going to change, and so I think there will be a lot of work in trying to come up with um, how to do those conditions for the various types of models. And um, we're trying to get some funding for this sort of work right now. So hopefully we'll be able to pursue it in the near near future. Um, so that's the pretty much the end. Um, here are references. Um, the last two are are the references that I, I alluded to that 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 we've um, we've published or submitted. And if you're interested in the preprint of the dynamic paper, this is um, available on my website, which is shown here. Um, so I'll I'll stop here. Um, let's see. 
uh, oh, oh, wow, okay, it's less time than I thought, but I'm happy to take questions. Sorry that it's a little longer than expected, but um, thank I you. think we have a list of questions in the oh, chat wow. room. And if okay. you can go over that and quickly answer yeah. them, <laughs> that would be nice. I do, okay, so one from Henry Yu. Uh, I do facial modeling in my work wherein irregular domains are handled by a mask function, one within and zero outside defined on the grid. I wonder what is the advantage of Schwartz over this masking method? Okay. So I guess I, I would have to maybe know more about the um, the, the the method. Um, does the method allow, I mean, it sounds like you would have the same mesh for both of the regions. Um, maybe, maybe that's not right. Uh, I, I guess, I don't know if people can, can speak during the seminar or not, but it sounds to me like maybe with this method, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to mesh the two parts separately, but I, I could be wrong. Um, so so I, I, I would think that that might be one advantage is that Schwartz would allow you to use different meshes and, and you, they would not need to be conformal. Um, so I think maybe that's something that, that we, we, we could maybe talk talk about more offline. So I, I don't know, if, um, Henry, if you want to send me an email or uh, we, we could definitely chat more about it all, offline, but um, some of the details of what, what your method actually does, because I, 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 I think I need to, need to know a little bit more about, about how it works. Um, what are advantages over of this method over tied slide surfaces? Um, so I guess, okay, I, I'm not sure what you mean by, are you, the, are you referring, is this referring to sort of tied contact? Um, yes, yes. Oh, tied contact. Uh, well, so, okay, so I guess I, I, I'm also, so the, the contact part we haven't done with, with the method, um, the contact is something we're, we're tackling uh, now. Um, I think, so I mean, I guess when I think of sort of tie contact or contact, I think of that as a non-overlapping framework, whereas this framework is overlapping. Um, I think you you actually could formulate, so we, we started looking at the non-overlapping version of this now for contact. Um, you do need to change the transmission conditions for that. You you could actually, there are kind of non-overlapping versions of of the, well, I guess I already said this, of the method with, with different conditions. We We haven't actually looked at we haven't compared the overlapping version to the non-overlapping version for the purpose of multi-scale coupling. Um, that's something that we are starting to look at now. So, so that may be something that um, that that comes up there. But um, I, I think the conditions would have to change um, within the Schwartz coupling if you're going to have it be non-overlapping. It's, it's like what I'm thinking of when you're when you mentioned the the tied slide surfaces. Um, let's see. Uh, okay, that one already answered. In time interpolation, does this mean that you will need to extrapolate from the course to find time step? Um, so you may need to do some, ex well, okay, I guess it depends on, well, let, let me go to the, the slide. So what I mean, oh, crap, where is it? All right. Um, slides here. All right. Ah, here we go. So um, essentially what, what I mean by, by interpolation is so let's say um, let's say that you're 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 in the second domain which has a smaller time step. You're gonna need to so in your in your first domain you only had the, the solution here and here and you're gonna need to somehow get it at this time. So I guess I, I don't really call that extrapolation. I would still, you're, you're not gonna go to some, I, well, I guess it depends on how you define extrapolation, but, but you're- so my, concern you, was you the, my concern was the next green line. So when you go back to the green domain at the third time step, so how are you going to then project, are you gonna do the third time step of red and then interpolate back to the to the green or does the green, so I guess it's just the coupling is the is the question because you you have you know four lines for the green and three for the red. So these That's lines the are meant to be the time step. So right. So the, the third time the third time step of the green. How um, where does that boundary condition come from? Is it an interpolation of having finished the red? Well, so okay, it is from the red, but the red will have already gotten to T one, so it will take this guy and this guy. 
Ah, okay, that was it. That was the simple yeah, question. Yeah, yeah. So I don't, I don't consider it extrapolation because that's that's the kind of the, the idea. Yeah, thanks for clarifying of this controller time step because one domain will have reached this before you go to the ne next one. So it's it's not really extrapolation in that sense. But yeah, that's that's kind of this is a little bit of a nuance and detail with how you do that. But yeah, good good question. Sorry to belay the, the question though, but it seems to me then I don't know how you interpolate from the two the, the second and third green time step back to the first the second time step in the red. Which I think you have as arrows in um, your next. So there, presumably at the red, you've interpolated from two of the green, but you know, but you haven't gotten the third green time step because you haven't completed all of the red time step. I guess it was just confusing from the schematic, and maybe I'm just. Oh well, yeah. Well, so I think the idea is that the green. So when when you're doing this, the green has already made it to T1. So you would use these two for the red the second time if that makes sense yeah no worries i was maybe yeah, I was just it, it may be yeah, we, we spent a while on this animation it was supposed to make it easier but there may be some some confusion with it so i apologize for that um let's see um uh let's see that one i answered william almer sorry the next question is william almer yeah is there a limit? Oh, I'm not reading who's, who's answering. I'm sorry about that. Um, William Elmer, is there a limit where the overlap is so small that the stability limit showed dominates over those of the individual domains? And if so, is that is that limit more than an element width of the fine mesh? So um, I think you're talking about the, the stability limit for 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 this. For, you mean the, the the dynamic one? This one here, I assume. Is that is that what you're referring to? Um, so, I mean, the smaller the overlap, the more iterations the method will converge in. And I think if it's if if it's getting really really small, then you you may have some issues kind of with um, the boundary conditions not being the right ones. We we haven't really um, we haven't done this limiting case because um, I guess our our aim mostly uh, has been sort of to come up with decompositions that would be that would make sense for the problems that our analysts are running. So um, I, the the case I showed with the, the bolted joint, the overlap is very small there. It's not in this limit. But um, we, we just we haven't had a need to look at that that limit case practically because in, in practice people aren't usually going to do a domain decomposition like this or they haven't had to. Um, it would be interesting to look at that, like to do maybe a more thorough uh, numerical study to go along with the theory, certainly. So that, that may be something to, to look at. Um, I, I think you're right that there probably would be something, something, you know, there may be some issues if you get to really small, very tiny overlaps, like you say. Um, Henry, you, uh, again, so if it seems the goal of Schwartz method is to handle differently meshed regions, fine both course, not just the regular shape regions. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Yeah. So one of the motivations is to, to simplify the task of meshing these complex geometries and to let you basically um, kind of plug and play with different pieces so that you can um, you know, mesh different parts separately. And if you want to push them a little bit and, and swap them out for other pieces, you can, um, you can um, easily do that with the coupling framework. Could this method handle subtractive geometry? Chris Golas. Um, so what do you mean by subtractive geometry? <laughs> If you wanted to make a hole in a piece, like you have oh. been showing. Oh, that's so. You're saying like one geometry is embedded in the other. Is that or yeah, in a negative way? Um, I guess I so the 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 embedded part. I think we've been asked this before. I, I think you can do that. We haven't tried it. I guess I don't. I don't know how what what you mean by. I mean, you wouldn't if it's if it's subtracted, you wouldn't have a PDE in it, right? So I, guess I, I don't I don't I don't know if I understand the the practical use case of that, but um, I, I you can you can fully embed the geometry. That's that's actually a really good question. We haven't tried it, but but we've thought about that, and I think you should be able to do that with the method. But um, yeah, I guess subtractive. I I, I don't quite because I mean the method requires you to have different PDEs, and so if you're just cutting out a piece, then that would just that would just change your geometry. I mean, you, you wouldn't you wouldn't have a you know you just wouldn't have the, anything in the, in the subtracted region. I would think so. I guess I'm not I'm not sure I know when that would be kind of useful, but 
um, non-overlapping would be Dirichlet to Neumann Schwartz. Yes, I agree. So um, there are Dirichlet, yeah, so Dirichlet to Neumann, there's a lot of different formulations here. Um, Gander has looked a lot at this, a lot of different, Leons has looked a lot of this, at this. Um, you can do either Robin, Robin conditions. You can do um, also alternating, you know, Dirichlet and Neumann, Dirichlet and Neumann, that type of a thing. And there are a lot of regularization parameters that you may want to kind of tweak in that. So, um, so there's lots, lots to, lots to do there for the non-overlapping. Um, oh, slide 42. Uh, I guess. Okay, I think, I think that uh, we're probably way over time now. And, um, pretty much cover everything. I, I think so, Irina. Well, <laughs> let's. <laughs> Thank you so much for the great talk and great uh, the research. Uh, it's really exciting to see your uh, awesome work. Uh, and it's, it's been. You reach out to me if, if people have more questions or if people are interested, feel free to email me um, or we can set up another Skype meeting to talk more if you'd like more information. Exactly, exactly. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for staying uh, over time, uh, both Irina, you and the audiences. Uh, but um, I think some of the, the folks who uh, asked the question on the chat room, uh, they actually left because they have uh, other things to do. And okay. so some of them couldn't probably hear your answer. So I will All try right. to, I will try to connect the, 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 the person who asked the question and with, with you, Irina, uh, okay. via email so that you can be connected uh, and then continue the discussion. But otherwise, uh, thank you so much and both Irina, you and the audiences, and and I think it was a great talk. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, the next, next seminar will be the January 21st, and until then, uh, stay safe and stay healthy. All right. Bye, everyone.